Hello, everyone. Uh, it is a great honor for us to be here and to present our project to you. My name is Mingyu Kim. And my name is Yunjin Kim. Uh, we are currently in Master in Architecture program at, at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design. I had my undergraduate education in studio art and art history at Dartmouth College. And Yunjin ha earned a Bachelor of Science in Architecture from University College London. Our project is called Constructing Sensory Palette, Architectural Solution to a Well-Balanced State Between the Top-Down and Bottom-Up Processes in the Brain. Our presentation today is structured into three sections. First, we'll talk about our concept of sensory palette, which was, a, which was the concept behind our design. Second, we'll talk about how we realized our idea, which was through the development of the grid system. And then lastly, we'll talk about how our design could be best implemented. So first of all, what is sensory palette and why is it important? It is generally known that for child development, a variety of sensory experiences are important. Indeed, they help children develop abilities to appreciate multi-dimensions of their environment. However, it is not enough for the sensory experiences to be simply various. For example, if an environment is too unacquainted for children, it may cause too much stress and induce, induce too much stress or keep distracting their attention. The various sensory experiences need to be well balanced. And our thesis is that the best learning for children and, ch and the students occurs through well balanced sensory experiences. Then what does it exactly mean to be well balanced sensory experiences? We mean that the various sensory experiences ought to stimulate both types of processes involved in perception, the top down and the bottom up. The top-down processing facilitates perception based on internal representations of goals or intentions, while the bottom-up processing largely relies on the nature of sensory stimuli. They are respectively associated with goal-directed behaviors and habitual behaviors. And according to Nathaniel Daw, Yan Niv, and Peter Diane in their study in 2005, a learning model using a mixture of these two processes yields higher accuracy in goal-oriented tasks than a model of just one process. If we look deeper into the brain, we can see how the top-down and the bottom-up processes are happening both at the neural level and at systems level. At the neural level, neurons carry out top-down and bottom-up processes with help of the pyramidal neurons that output the signals. In this two-way process of top-down and bottom-up signals, learning, which is the association between the sensory input and the behavioral output, enhances the top-down processing. And it is the combination of these two processes that, facili that facilitates the best learning. Also at the systems level, as seen in the left image, the brain has regions dedicated for the top-down processing, the frontal lobe, and the bottom-up processing, the posterior parts of the brain. The diagram on the right shows how for a person to output a good behavior from a sensory input, parts for the down parts for the top-down processing, which is on the left of the diagram, and parts for the bottom-up processing, which is on the right of the diagram, are both necessary. Hence, we propose to construct a sensory palette from which the children and students will be able to draw sensory experiences that will be balanced. In order to realize the sensory palette, we, cre we created a grid system. The grid system consists of two axes. It is our intention to provide the balance between top-down and bottom-up processes for children at different levels of development. We have one axis that ranges between bottom-up and top-down processes, and the other axis that is associated with the children's development. In this way, we not only provide a variety of experiences, but also are able to look after varying needs for children at different levels of development. First, specializing this system, we implemented the top-down and the bottom-up axis through the sharedness of the programs. Spaces along this axis range from spaces for individual activities to spaces for communal activities. Second, the axis for children development was specialized through catering to body scales. Towards one end of this axis, spatial elements are small and intimate for small children while on the other hand, spatial elements are large for high school students. Then, programs were appro appropriately placed into the grid. 
Spaces that are mostly sensory, such as garden and a classroom for young children, were placed on the bottom right, while spaces for the intellectual activities, such as library, were placed on the top left. Spaces for motor activities, such as a gymnasium, a creative art space, and a playground were placed in the middle. Next, we'll go in more detail how these two axes work. According to a study by Malcolm Brown and John Eggleton, there exists a dual memory system in our brain that separately detects novelty and familiarity, which respectively becomes stimulus for top-down and bottom-up processes. We can stimulate the top-down processing by providing novel experiences and the bottom-up processing by a sense of familiarity. Towards the individual end of the sharedness axis, a user builds familiarity within the same age group within the intimate space for individual use. On the other hand, spaces for on the shared end encourage the individuals to come out of their comfort zones and socially interact. Encounters with different age groups provide a fertile ground for novel experiences, which is more conducive to the top-down processing. At the same time, the body scale axis divides the other axis and groups together the students of similar age. It will allow each group to experience both top-down and bottom-up processes across the plan. Each student group needs different experiences to achieve balance between top-down and bottom-up processes. For instance, young girl children overall need more physical sensory experiences than high school students. High school students overall need more cognitive activities. Grouping user groups allows for the design to cater to such individual needs. With the combination of these two axes, a sensory palette has been created to provide the children and student with well-balanced sensory experiences. This is the floor plan of the school created after we followed the grid system. In this plan, if a child wants more of an efficient habit-driven behavior, he or she can spend more time in places that are familiar and provide stimuli for the bottom of processing. If a student wants to carry out creative goal-directed behavior, she and he or she can go to intellectual areas that give a, a sense of novelty and stimulate the top-down processing. Our rendering of this view was taken from the southeastern corner of the plan, where the main entrance to the school is located. This is also where the smallest children have their classroom and the adjacent garden. The classroom, as we said, is tailored to the child's body sizes so that the environment becomes familiar, therefore associated with the bottom-up processing. The garden, on the other hand, is where the children actively explore and be exposed to the novel experiences associated with the top-down processing. This view is from the inside of the library, located on the northwestern corner of our plan, since the library should not be just for the older high school students, we incorporated a series of stepped platforms to give size variations within the large space. This loosely holds each user grip and provides some level of familiarity within the novel space. This view shows the connective green space in the central part of the school. It acts as an open circulatory space for people coming in and out of the library the cafeteria and the creative art space. Also, it contains much greenery that reduces overall level of stress and trees that are visible from almost everywhere in the school. This last view shows a glimpse into the outdoor green space on the, on the left, the creative art space, the playground and the garden in the middle and the classrooms that are increasing in size to the right. We wanted to foster natural integration among programs and place them side by side, minimizing the use of corridors and pathways. Spaces meant for the sensory, motor or intellectual activities are then naturally integrated. In this way, the children and students are able to effectively explore the diverse spaces that provide various stimulus for their best development. As the last section, we'll briefly talk about our plan for the implementation of the design. 
So the school will be built in three phases. During the first phase, the features related to the smallest children from kindergarten to K3 will be built. They include the garden, the small size classroom, the outdoor open space, an office, and a storage room. This area pertains more to the sensory experiences than to the motor or cognitive activities. We group these features together in order to cater to the young children whose brain development is the most active in sensory information processing. During the second phase, the features related to the middle school students will be built. Students in early teenage years, they developed at advanced motor skills, and it is known that the uh, very creative activities are very beneficial to them in developing their abstract reasoning. Serving this need, adequate programs such as the middle school classroom, an ex extended open space, and a creative art space and the cafeteria are provided at this stage. Lastly, the features for the high school students, including their classroom, the indoor gymnasium, and the library will be built. These spaces are related to intellectual development as the frontal lobe does. Indeed, brains develop in the order of the sensory, the motor, and the cognitive, and we plan to deliver the construction of the school at the pace of a child's brain development. On our site in the Yantalo community, we hope that our design will make harmony with the surroundings. We also thought about the feasibility of the design and chose similar building materials to the local buildings. Through these considerations, we came to design a building that is not only for educating the young, but also for communal activities. With easy accessibility and open spaces in the middle, the school will bring community together as well. In conclusion, this school is a sensory pilot in which children and students will be able to have various sensory experiences necessary for their balanced growth. This is the end. Thank you very much.